Hello, I'm Andrew Watson from the Institute's Queensland Chapter of the Climate Action and Sustainability Committee, and welcome to this webinar on Net Zero Heroes. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which this event is taking place. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. This webinar discusses how architects can help lead the way towards a sustainable future. The session will focus on the vision, accomplishments and the challenges faced by both small and large practices to move towards becoming net zero heroes. We hope to cover topics such as what does net zero mean, how to determine your carbon footprint, how carbon offsetting works, how to certify as carbon neutral. We have four speakers to give a brief overview of their experience. Ian Smale from Pangolin Associates, Paul Worrell from Red Dog Architects, Peter McCargill, but Peter McCardle from PMTA and Mark Rose from Hassel. We'll hear from each in turn and then hopefully have a little time for questions at the end. Please place any questions via the Q&A icon on the Zoom taskbar below. And please check that you are on mute. We are also aware that the Institute is holding a climate action forum starting at 1 p.m. on the current proposals for zero carbon action. Should you choose to either stay with us or leave early, both webinars are being recorded and will be available from the Institute. Okay, so um, first speaker is going to be Ian Smale. He's the, uh, Ian is the Managing Director and Founder of Pangolin Associates, the first and currently the only gold standard carbon auditor in Australia. He has an extensive knowledge of carbon offsetting in many sectors across Australia and globally, and supporting clients with their current credit projects. He has led several clients through the Climate Action Carbon Neutral Program. Ian, if you'd like to share your screen. Thanks, Andrew, and um, very delighted to be part of this um, presentation today. And first, I just want to say congratulations to all the architects out there being in the first industry wide sector approach to a climate emergency where. I think it was the height of the bushfires in November 2019, um, close to a thousand architect firms signed a climate emergency, followed by commitments to carbon footprinting and carbon charity. And I think you've led by example and a lot of other industry sectors have followed, such as builders declare and planners declare. So um, kudos to the organisations to taken that up. Um, and just before I start a bit of background as well, we've been going at 11 years as a company with, with about 35 architecture firms to date on carbon management, carbon charity, as well as most of the property sector from like Savannah Land Lease and uh, Brookfield, GPT, Dexas. And we've also helped around half of the certified capital organisations in Australia under the Climate Active Program. Um, Paul, Paul from Red Dogs kindly let me share the footprint work we've done for him recently. So th today we'll give a bit of an overview of what's involved in a carbon footprint, what it means to be carbon neutral net zero and what's involved being climate to carbon certified under the government program as well. Um, so this is a, just a snapshot of a footprint and you pr probably see a lot of talk in the media these days around different scopes of emissions, uh, um, scope one, two and three. And this is just globally accepted that the ways of way of measuring carbon uh, scope one, I, I describe it as carbon emissions coming out of the tailpipe of an organization. So, uh, so it could be fuel from a company owned vehicle, uh, diesel generator on site at a um, construction site. There's any carbon emissions emanating directly from the operations of that organization or that activity. S scope two is purchase electricity. So it's the share of the power grid used by that organization. And then scope three is the more complex one. It's all of the supply chain emissions such as um, purchase of IT equipment or taking a flight or, or not taking a flight these days. Under, in Australia, we've got mandatory reporting legislation and that impacts on scope one and two emissions. So organisations emitting over 25,000 tonnes at a facility of 50,000 tonnes at a corporate level have to report by law. And that is um, combination of scope one and two emissions only. If they fail to report or get it wrong, there's actually potential large fines around that. When we had the carbon price, that was just looking at scope one emissions and that was organisations emitting over 25,000 tonnes would have to pay a carbon price about $25 a tonne at the time. So that may come back in the future one day. But for organisations setting 
targets for reduction, net zero carbon, which is essentially interchangeable terms. Um, that's got to sort of look at all, all three scopes. And I'll just move into a more detailed um, table, which this is a, fa a fairly typical table for a organization. In this case, it's, it's for Red Dog Architects. So it gives you an idea of um, what sort of things get looked at for a, a carbon footprint. The first line is, is what people get billed for for their electricity. And that's essentially just coming off the um, uh, power bill. There's normally another line here, if you're in a tenanted building, if you're one of 10 offices in a 10 story building, then you're liable for your, your percentage of the base building as well. So it becomes a base building line, such as um, lifts and air conditioning, et cetera. And um, this example too, it's actually good that they've actually got some silo as well and exporting back to the grid. It comes out of the footprint. Uh, excuse me. So things like um, IT equipment and paper, stationary office furniture, they're, they're what we call a supply ch chain or scope three emission. So they're being taken into account um, as well. So they, these goods and services get produced for the benefit of the end organization. So without those goods, the organization can't function so it contributes towards their carbon footprint. And then we end up with a, a total footprint there. It's to, to give um, an estimate for architecture firms because we benchmark quite a lot. Um, professional services firms are typically in the order of about eight to 12 tonnes per employee if we're, we're talking accounting or legal firms, but for some reason architecture firms come in well below that metric, um, typically about three to six tonnes per person. I think it's because the uh, architects operate on a much greener environment for a lot of ways. They're not doing a lot of interstate travel even historically, it's a lot of them take public transport to a city-based office and we find that overall their footprint's a lot less per employee than a typical organisation. So with this, um, these kind of measurements, it's not about taking that total number and looking at, oh, let's just go and buy 32 credits and become carbon, but looking at ways to try and reduce that footprint as well. So if you can re replace the electricity through efficiency programs, changing light globes, buying more efficient equipment. If you can source accredited green power, that's probably the number one consideration if you can't reduce. And then if not, you can also source accredited carbon to electricity, uh, encouraging people to have a more sustainable commute to and from work. Uh, working from home, it's probably a bit problematic because it's gonna be based on averages. And Business flights, in this example, quite small, but um, some of the bigger clients we've got have been fairly substantial in flights, sometimes up three or 4,000 tonnes or so, and encouraging more of that telecommuting aspect. Um, there's a lot of carbon tool products and services coming out there as well, which if you're supporting products that are certified carbon under the government's climate action program, that will also count as a reduction. So if you're, if for example, you use Australia Post today and you're posting uh, large envelopes or parcels through Australia Post retail outlet, that's a certified country delivery and that can come off your footprint too. So by supporting those organisations, that gives you a much um, like more sustainable footprint and lower footprint overall. I think that gives people a bit of an overview of what's involved in, in a footprint. There's actually about um, four or 500 different things we can measure in a footprint in terms of activities, but it's for office space, we know what the top 20 to 30 would be for a typical office based environment. It's when you get into product based things, there's a lot of different areas. We can look at the life cycle analysis and down the supply chain. I might move into the um, climate active program. So just let me screens. So you can either be um, carbon to net zero by simply measuring your footprint and offsetting with carbon credits, but if you do it that path, the owner's done, you'd explain what you've done. And that's explained who's measured the footprint, what's been included in the boundaries. And, and, and the onus lies on you to justify that, whether you've done it yourself or use the uh, credit of third party body. If, if you choose to become certified carbon tool, then the, then the government justifies your footprint. They've, they've done all the checks and balances and fully certified you. And this is probably the only true certification program around the capital claims. There's some, there's probably 
two overseas that compare to it, one in New Zealand government one and one came out of the British government. Uh, otherwise, there's a lot of um, private label ones popping up here and there that don't have a, I guess, a lot of the same lot of level of detail or scrutiny. There's no third party checks and balances. And what, what I mean by that is for an organisation to appear on this list, and there's about 220 organisations to date across about 350 certifications. There's about, I think, a dozen architect firms that have made the list now. And it involves having a consultant who's registered with the government, they're called a registered consultant, to do the inventory or the technical assessment. It also requires a registered auditor to actually audit the footprint. And then the government itself does a peer review and checks, and checks the offsetting as well. So it's, it's got a multi-layer process to ensure integrity in the scheme. There are some organisations on this list literally as small as two or three staff and then right up to obviously the likes of ANZ and Combank and falling across um, a number of different categories as well. So we've got um, one called, uh, it's called, uh, should be there, uh, Clark Hopkins Clark, for example, it's fairly unique actually. They appear both as an organisation, as architects, but also they, they also appear as a service category. So if someone's doing business with them, it's actually a carpentry service, not just an organization, so it lowers the footprint as well. Uh, to achieve carpentry without certification, that's a case of measuring a footprint similar to the example we showed before and offsetting with certified carbon credits. And then, um, and then repeating that process annually. To achieve the certification under Climactive, it's those two steps, but also involves paying a license fee to the government on an annual basis and submitting documentation to the government annually as well. It does require a one-off independent audit at the start of the process as well. And let's just um, jump into another. So and this, um, obviously one part of it is the footprint, one part is the certification. Another part is the offsetting, and sometimes people think being carpentry is just paying a charity to plants and trees. It's got to be using certified carbon credits to claim carbon charity. So carbon credits can come from tree planting or avoided deforestation or fuel switching or renewables. And it's got to be a, a certified carbon credit under one of the four main programs, such as VERA, Gold Standard, the emissions Reduction Fund's Australian Carbon Credit Union, which is, which is the government program, or CRs, which is another compliance program. But they're all treated in a very similar way where credits don't get bought by end clients, but they get retired on behalf of end organisations. And that means a batch of credits will have their serial number range allocated to that particular purpose and then retired for those that particular client. And that's in this example here, it just shows an organisation's purchase 178 wind farm credits of India sets to a number range has been applied to that organization, generated a unique time link and reference that organization. And that and that's a requirement for making making capital claims to have that proof of purchase and retirement. Right. How was the time going, Andrew? It's just about um, half now. So it's, yeah. uh, how you I think how you go. Yeah, I think um, you know, I can touch on a couple of case studies if it's worthwhile. We don't want to wait to a quick Q&A. Sorry? I can touch on a few examples of some way you're going to organisation. Um, if there's, a, if there's a, a very, very brief Q&A, uh, a very brief example you can go through now. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll um, just get, give a, a couple of very quick ones that aren't architecture related, but um, you can see uh, Australian Mines, for example, one of their drivers for going carpentry was Volkswagen's needed uh, cobalt for electric vehicles. They had a choice of buying that cobalt from Democratic Republic of Congo with obviously poor labour practices. Um, and Volkswagen's obviously lost its, uh, I guess, branding image from the past scandals. So buying cobalt from an Australian company that's certified carpentry was going to benefit them as well. And that more embodied sound. And then we've got the top one there, which is a three staff not-for-profit who are carbon to and they're actually receiving better grant funding 
for arts fund funding because they're a carbon neutral. So this, there's different sort of commercial reasons for doing it, but most organisations that are doing it believe it's the right thing to do and if they're getting some commercial benefit, it's good too. Okay, all right, that's, that's good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so um, our next speaker is, uh, is Paul Worrell. Paul is the founder and managing director of Red Dog Architects, a thriving and award-winning practice with 14 staff. He's currently a um, chapter counsellor at the Queensland chapter of the AIA and the current chairperson on the Queensland and Climate Action and Sustainability Committee. Working with Ian and Pangolin Associates, Red Dog Architects achieved carbon neutrality in 2020. Thanks very much for that, Andrew. Um, also, just like to um, thank Andrew as well for acknowledging um, the acknowledgement of country as well. Um, I'm just going to talk about our journey to becoming carbon neutral and just walk through the steps that we've taken, some of the challenges we faced and um, some of the things that we, the lessons we've learned along the way. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's start. So we joined the um, architect movement, um, the Global Architects Declare movement in 2019, um, and that was on the 30th of July. And I suppose like a, like a lot of other practices, we weren't sure what we were signing up for, and we weren't entirely sure what our obligations would be. Um, I suppose what we, what we did want to do though, and um, we were clear is that this wasn't, wasn't being seen to be a marketing exercise for us. This was actually um, to be seen as something that would have a positive um, outcome. So we were clear about wanting to be a more sustainable and sustaining practice, um, not only in terms of um, the work that we um, produce, but also in terms of um, our practice as a, biz as a business. Um, and I suppose this, this image for me sort of summed, uh, summed up a, a, a very important thing for us. And that was, this is a, a little crimson sunbird that's um, sitting in the leaf of a banana plant. Um, the bird has actually drunk the nectar from the flower and then water is collected back into the, um, the banana plant. And then the bird has used it as a way to clean itself. And I suppose what this did was this epitomised how nature manages survival by using the resources available. Unlike humans, who seem to continue to redefine the environment that we want to live in and subsequently damage it. So for me, this image illustrated adaptability, resourcefulness and resilience. And I suppose they were some of the key things that we focused on as we moved forward as a practice as well and undertook um, the uh, Architects Declare movement. So when, you, when we joined Architects Declare, you basically were committing to a three-step process. Um, and obviously there's practices out there that are still continuing on that journey, which is great. Um, we would like to see a lot more. Um, and it was a process to becoming carbon neutral. So it was about taking responsibility and ownership for our future, our planet's future, and also for the future of the people that work for the business as well. So the first step was about obtaining 100% green power. Second um, step was about conducting a carbon audit. And the third step was about going carbon neutral. Um, I think one of the other things I just wanted to make clear is that the journey is never, um, is never possible without not encouraging and having other people within the office take some ownership as well and understanding the challenge. So everybody in the office has been part of this journey. So step one was about 100% green power. So um, what we did was by purchasing green power, we're supporting Australia's renewable energy sector by displacing our electricity use, usage with green power accredited renewable energy certificates, or um, as you probably have seen them annotated as RECs. Um, so being 100% green power meant we needed to display our electricity unage, usage was with an accredited renewable energy certificates. 
And the first step was about obtaining or sourcing a provider. And there were there are only a few of them at the time. Um, there's a few more around now, but um, we decided to choose a national provider called PowerShop, um, who advocate against using fuels, and they are also themselves carbon neutral. So we went to three providers. Um, we chose PowerShop. Our power bill actually went up in terms of cost, up to $180, but this was mainly due to a discount that our original power provider gave us. Step two. So step two was when we decided to engage with um, Pangolin. So originally we, we looked at doing this online like, like probably a lot of people do and we thought, oh, we'll do this audit assessment stuff ourselves and try and do it internally. I suppose what we what we in the architecture field and we're extremely responsive to work with. I will point out that we went to two practices at the time. We went to another practice called Glowing Green, which was um, uh, directed by Larissa Rose. Um, so if anyone is looking for one, um, uh, I can also recommend them as well. But at the end of the day, we were impressed by Pangolin's um, reporting methods and also by what they offered. So basically that then sent us into a bit of a tailspin um, because we had to collect a year's worth of data. So we had to, as Ian was mentioning before, we had to identify staff commuting, electricity, water consumption, our state turned their screens off. Um, turning the printer off, another thing that's sometimes left on when you leave the office. Printing double-sided, printing in black and white, not colour. Um, not printing at all, another thing that um, we've now started to encourage among staff as well. So th they might seem like simple things, but at the end of the day, they made a big difference. Um, and, and we're learning from those things as we go along. So I just went through those and obviously spoke a little bit about um, lessons learned. Um, and obviously um, we've, we've every, all the staff have taken um, the opportunity to um, embrace those things. Um, it still takes time though. So um, it doesn't happen overnight. So step three, which was obviously we 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 you know we weren't we weren't carbon neutral at this stage. Um, so step three was about becoming carbon neutral, um, and I suppose what we needed to do initially, and over time we hope that we might not need to do this, but we we obviously um, were advised that we we needed to probably purchase some carbon credits. Um, and Pangolin gave us a number of list of projects um, that we could select from. And um, we chose one to, to stay local. Um, that was something we were clear about because you can obtain carbon credits um, outside of Australia as well. And we also chose something that was maybe related to a community. Um, so um, the, the slide up there illustrates the certificate that we've got um, and we've um, supported the Tiwi Island Savannah Burning Project. Um, and we chose this um, because we felt that one, it, it built wealth for traditional owners through social, cultural, environmental and economic benefits of carbon farming projects. Um, th this is also, and I think Ian mentioned this, this is not a case of paying to pollute. Um, this is, this is a, a case of um, selecting credits that um, do something um, positive and um, contribute in a, in a um, a way that um, provides better for an, another community. I think there is always um, the ability to improve on this. Um, it's about evolution, it's about learning, and it's about educating as well. So um, obviously over time, we, we hope to maybe not purchase any credits, but um, we still have a little way to go to before we do that. So, obviously we became carbon neutral. We, were, we, we, we thought that was a, a great move. Um, but, you know, we've, we've also done some things at a local level that we feel can also contribute. Um, I suppose one of the first obvious things is we, we operate out of an, a, an old sort of industrial building. So therefore we've recycled the building um, in terms of left a lot of the existing infrastructure, um, the structure and therefore um, sort of paired it back and to, to suit our office. Um, we rely heavily on natural um, daylight as much as possible. 
um, and try not to turn on the artificial lighting until we need it. Um, we've, we've, these photos are reasonably um, old now because our office is now full of plants. Um, so again, about improving air quality in the office. Uh, we recycle as many materials as we can as part of the office development. Um, we get a lot of samples from suppliers. We ask them to actually come back and take them and recycle them if possible. We don't throw them away. Um, we've, uh, we're about to introduce an electric car charging point um, to our building. Um, we encourage riding and walking to the office and support a number of sporting events around cycling as well. Um, and we have bike spaces and change facilities um, and we have a worm farm. So again, just little things. So people um, uh, learn to do something with their, with their food wastes and scraps. We encourage people to take bags when they go shopping rather than purchasing more bags. Um, and we're also um, tend not to use any plastic bags within the office now, which is positive. Um, other things that we've also taken a positive action um, uh, in is uh, we joined the Architects Assist, which was a disaster recovery architecture and design pro bono services, which was during the time that um, there were some fairly severe natural disasters um, that affected Australia and um, there were some other circumstances. So we were one of over 600 firms that got involved with that. Um, our office took part in the global climate strike back in 20th of September 2019 um, and we will continue to support um, any strikes to do with um, climate change. Um, we have a government that doesn't seem too keen on, on, on doing much about it. So I think we need to um, have a voice and um, need to be heard. Um, we continually seek to educate our clients about the benefits of sustainability in their projects. So, um, and we talk about our experiences um, and we've had a number of projects that have been recognized for um, doing things um, sustainably well. Um, Garden Bunky in this image was the 2019 Houses Award for Sustainability. Um, the JB House, which is another one of the images here, um, is an existing house that was reconfigured and um, does not only use as passive measures um, and we recycled a lot of materials um, and obviously um, introduced a lot of passive design principles in our thinking as well. Um, in terms of social sustainability, we've, we've done the sleep out for homelessness now for two years in a row. Um, at Christmas time, we, we go and help the Salvation Army with um, their Christmas packaging. Um, and we're involved with a no number of other um, events as well um, that, again, help people that need it more than um, need assistance um, along the way. And obviously, um, I think, you know, a big part of sustainability is also social sustainability um, and we should not forget that or neglect it. So, um, but like I said, um, we've, we've, we've enjoyed the journey. Um, it doesn't have an end, it's continuous. Um, and I think if um, everyone can jump on board and do their little bit, I think hopefully we can, we can um, make a change. So, um, so thank you, Andrew. That's, um, that's my talk. Thank you, Paul. Really good, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to um, Peter McArdle. And uh, just, just to let everybody know as well uh, that um, Mark is unable to attend today. So we have a, a little bit of extra time for questions at the end. So um, Peter, he, uh, Peter has a, a small architectural practice on the Gold Coast, focusing on how to apply sustainable practices to projects. His thesis addressed sustainable technologies in architecture. Peter's practice deals mainly with residential projects, including home designs, townhouses, and the partly involved with the Net Zero project, with Pangolin Associates providing consultant advice. Peter. And uh, Paul, I think Thanks, you might just need to unshare the screen. Great, thank you. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for driving my slides today. Um, I'm going to be rude and turn my video off, guys, because I'm on a narrow bandwidth, so hopefully I don't drop out. Um, 
PTMA Architecture is a small family-based practice on the Gold Coast, as Andrew mentioned. We aim to move our work in a progressively more sustainable direction to the degree each client budget and site allows. Our discussion today explores our limited understanding of carbon footprints as we're starting to look at carbon neutrality in our projects. Carbon neutral in this context being as we understand it, the carbon embodied in materials and their manufacture, such as steel or aluminium, the carbon used in uh, the construction of the dwelling itself, so electricity and fuels by the builder, carbon used in the, in the eventual decommissioning of the project at the end of its useful life, so designing projects for longevity matters, and an assessment of the likely energy consumed in the use and maintenance of the house and site over time. The project I'm discussing today is, the home of, um, is a home in one of the valleys behind the beach on the Gold Coast. The existing buildings on the site included over 400 square metres of internal floor area between an existing home and a pool house, which are both being substantially renovated or rebuilt in this project. The only new building work added is a new garage with a turf roof. Our client in this project is committed at the outset to reducing their carbon footprint in the project build and in their lives in the home. They've agreed to pay to offset the carbon, uh, which remains after we reduce the carbon through design improvements. This will be determined by an audit, audit by pangolins after construction. So for this project, the carbon offsets are likely to be in the order of five to $25,000 for materials and decommissioning of the house at the end of its life cycle. This range does depend on the type of credits the client chooses to purchase. As Paul said, pangolins can recommend a range of credit options um, and the prices can range from about $10 to $30 per tonne being offset. For this project, the total costs for offsetting the project life cycle energy costs could be up to $50,000. That would include electricity used for the life of the dwelling. However, a fair proportion of these costs can be reduced simply by purchasing green power to run the house or generating their own electricity with PVs. And acknowledging the carbon price has allowed us to better justify high quality construction and products in the project, as well as helping further the case for solar batteries, uh, solar power and batteries. For future projects, we'll be recommending to clients to include a PC allowance or a budget item from the outset for this purpose. They can choose to spend the money in the same way they can choose to spend money on landscape, a pool or an expensive kitchen, but we want it to become a choice they need to make rather than something simply not considered. So to date in this project, we've reduced the carbon footprint in several ways. These include that the design is currently rating over nine stars, uh, energy rating assessment. Improving the star rating reduces, in theory at least, the energy used to live comfortably in the home. Reuse of existing buildings to extent practical, so that reduces new material use. In this case, it includes the existing floor slab and the footings of the existing home, pavers on site for new masonry walls for thermal mass internally, and reusing trusses. Double glazing through the home to allow the opening sizes to remain larger with less impact on the performance of the home. A fully electric home, uh, which allows the clients to generate their own power and buy green electricity from the grid for any power that is required. So this includes a solar PV array and home battery system, all electric cooking, heating, electric car, and the client's committed to getting an electric mower and an electric boat. This makes a substantial saving in the carbon footprint, uh, reducing the overall lifetime of the house by around 1,500 tonnes. The hydronic heating in the slab runs from the electric heat pump for the cooler winter months in the valley. Maintaining the exi existing fireplace in the home allows that to be used when desired. And we all actually cut a third of the existing home area out of the new house footprint and converted that into an internal courtyard, which runs through the middle of the home and is covered with polycarbonate roof and operable louvers to help the home open and breathe in all weathers. A smaller home would have helped further, but the clients were keen on the size of home they've ended up with. We're comfortable that these efforts have improved the home design, its comfort and sustainability. However, we've engaged with Pangolins as a carbon consultant in the design process. This is our first venture into the formal assessment of our projects and it's not completed yet, so please bear this in mind. Some key areas in the design and the process as we understand them would be, in terms of the figures mentioned above, 4,000 tonnes of carbon in this project, 800 of which might relate to the materials and energy in the build and the decommissioning after construction. Around 1,500 tonnes is, um, is being offset by the solar PV system over its life cycle by generating, generating the power needed on site 
So sizing a solar system to suit the project is important. Energy can then be further offset by purchase of green power, as mentioned. Replacing aluminium frames for windows with PVC frames reduces carbon in the materials. This could have been further reduced by moving to a sustainably sourced timber frames. Taking this extra step might have reduced another 25, uh, 25 tonnes for the PVC frames down to five tonnes for timber. Uh, using a standing seam zinc roof and walling instead of standard colour bond roof system. This reduced the carbon by around about five tonnes. Um, so to date, our impression is the air conditioning, pool heating and electricity use dwarf many of the decisions made in building materials. So um, choosing air conditioners or sizing air conditioners or avoiding air conditioners and pool heating is important. Some of the biggest contributors to the total include um, then pool heating and air conditioning, uh, so better refrigerant gases are progressively becoming available to run these systems, uh, just as they did with the banning of the ozone depleting gases a decade or two ago. So supporting the newer gases as they come out is important. The pool's really large in this case, it was an existing pool. So it's having a disproportionate impact on the carbon footprint of the development, especially because the client does want to heat it, of course. So a uh, pool cover would make a disproportionate distant, um, difference consider considering the small cost. Um, so then in terms of the carbon audit process, understanding who the carbon audit is helping. Uh, we struggled with the timing of the involvement of the consultant first time around. We needed to have documented the project sufficiently to allow us to extract the information that pangolins needed to perform their audit, such as wall areas separated by type of wall system, floor area by type of floor, volume of concrete in the footings and proportion approximately of concrete to steel in these systems. But in order to do this, the project needed to have been documented to a standard, which also allowed the builder to price and construction to commence. So it did, which means that we feel like um, by the time we've received the feedback from pangolins through no fault of their own, construction's underway and design changes have become difficult to make. On the other hand, introducing them earlier would have taken more time on our part to estimate areas and volumes, sometimes prior to knowing what we were estimating or paying a QS to do the same. Based on this and other findings, we believe at the moment that the design stage carbon audit helps us as architects primarily. And so we plan to continue to engage a carbon consultant directly uh, rather than a project by project basis so that we hold uh, the audit that they've generated for this project as a template that we can benchmark our office projects from. So with little lead time and little investment of time or cost, we can use this in future projects. Uh, so rather than guessing on future projects, we can test our assumptions. Documentation of the design, so learning to document in whatever software you use so that it can generate the areas you need. So for example, there are different ways to model slab edges. You might draw them by hand or in 2D, 3D, and each of the different methods will take more or less time later in terms of determining the areas that your carbon consultant needs. The same with wall types. Um, so as you're moving through the process, see if your software can generate the answers that you're going to need later if you want to uh, in, become involved in this process. Uh, post-construction audit then. So the carbon footprint is more accurately measured post-construction in an audit process, which takes the documentation from the project with changes during the construction and information tracked during the construction. The builder in this instance is tracking the materials from the existing building and whether they've been recycled, demolished and dumped or downcycled for use elsewhere. Obviously minimising landfill. Average staff days on site, how far they travelled each day to be at the site. Number of skip bins emptied, that sort of thing. So pangolins will then be able to make a more detailed assessment of the likely energy uh, to create the home and then also the energy needed to live in the home. The client will be engaging pangolins for that final audit post-construction. Carbon offsets, so we intend recommending to clients to allow a budget or a PC item, as we mentioned, for the carbon footprint of their project in future. The carbon offset cost will vary depending on whether they choose to offset for the materials used in the build only, or the materials used in the build and a budget to cover demissioning of the building after its life's over, or to cover energy use in the building as well. And obviously that's a client's choice. With this in mind, our client would have the option to do a post-construction assessment as a post-occupancy evaluation of the project. So some years down the track actually determine how much energy they have used in the building. 
And with this in mind, the client loves technology. So we're putting smart controls in the house uh, to allow the connection of a weather station uh, to measure the internal comfort and external comfort, how often the active systems are run and what energy they use, what grid power and grid water is used, what volume of tank water is used and so on, so that we have that information in future, as well as the client just loving that side of things. Um, while much of this post-occupancy work is beyond our control as architects, we want to start to design projects and systems with the intent that they can achieve this should clients or others need or want the data over time. There's interest from universities or CSIRO, for example, to have real world data of our design so they can test uh, the energy modeling that gives us our star rating prior to construction and see what that looks like in reality. So in, in conclusion, in our own small business, we intend over time to start to contribute to raising awareness of the impact of the carbon footprint of our homes and offices and projects and raise awareness of our ability and obligations as architects to affect positive change. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks, Peter. That was really interesting looking project as well there. Um, right, so that's the the time for the uh, the, the the speakers. Um, there have been a few questions that have come through, and some of those have already been answered. But uh, we might just take a couple of them quickly, just to, uh, so others can see the um, the questions. Uh, one here for uh, for Ian was how much of an impact on energy usage does sourcing materials from local instead of shipping overseas? How how did that? Uh, yeah, that's vary? that's a really that's a really <coughs> excuse me, a really fun question because um, the transport emissions can vary a lot whether it's sea or air freight, and in some cases that's the way the products actually manufactured will have a greater impact. Um, there's a interesting parallel where flowers get flown into Europe actually have a much lower carbon footprint than flowers grown in Europe because the greenhouse impact is so much higher there. So it's, it, we've got New Zealand lamb being shipped to UK has a smaller footprint than British lamb being sold in the UK. So it's, it's, it's not a simple answer to that question, unfortunately. It's sort of, a, yeah, there's products being made in, say, New Zealand but with renewable power being sold here or they're being made here with power by coal power. So it's... it's um, and we're getting some organisations are moving their shipping to sea freight because it's got a lower impact than air freight as well. So, so it is a it is a very complex question to a, a complex answer to a very simple question in some ways. So that helps a bit. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, um, another one here was uh, just about carbon credits and the pricing of carbon credits. Uh, is that driven by demand? Uh, how how the the credit, um, you know, how do they get to that particular benchmark? That yeah, yeah it's been driven both by both demand, supply, and the type of project. For example, a, a large scale hydro project is going to have a lower price point than a boutique one uh, providing cook stoves in Africa to and empowering women. And there's a recent 12 to 18 months there's been a much bigger demand on on the purchase of carbon credits with more businesses going up to up till generally last year the biggest participant in the government's program was brisbane city council about 500,000 tons per year Tulsa jumped in in july last year at 2.3 million tons uh delta airlines joined or became ca carbon neutral just before the pandemic at about 5 million tons so this, just in the last 12 to 18 months there's been a massive uptake in organizations with net zero capital pledges and uptake and there's also supply issues with less carbon credits being generated from renewable power because in the developing world, it's now cheaper to build renewable power stations than it is coal power stations. So you can't create carbon credits for something that's cost effective against coal power, for example. We're seeing things like uh, solar plants in Saudi Arabia generating electricity at uh, profitably at just over one half cents US per kilowatt hour. So if you look at your power bill, you'd be quite jealous if you get that price. So there is, yeah, a, quite a big back on both supply, demand, and nature of the projects overall. Uh, okay, all right. Um, look, I, I had a question for, um, for for Peter as well. Um, just in terms of his uh, project, he talked about the client, Peter. You talked about the client choosing what he might wish to offset 
Um, yes. What's your client doing in that regard for this particular project? Has he worked that through? Um, it's really topical at the moment, Andrew, just because we're going through some um, budgeting exercises for the final stage of construction. So that's in the mix. So their budget for offsetting could, it, as I mentioned, could be anywhere from five grand to 20 grand or more, depending on what they offset. But they're already putting on an 18 kilowatt solar system and batteries. So most of their electricity use will be offset on site. Um, and then they're committed to green power. So I suppose they're progressively offsetting their life in the house that way it really is only the construction they need to offset they, they want to go as far as they possibly can i suppose is my answer and it'll just it'll be determined by the budget right okay and the other thing with that is that, uh, you need a builder that's going to be open to wanting to be part of this approach as well uh because yeah. they sounds that need to do more keeping of records on the way they go about making their, uh, doing their construction. Is that right? That's right. And so in this case, um, the client's committing to try to help change the industry, which is a wonderful thing and quite rare. Um, so they've picked a builder with no particular experience in this, but they're very engaged with it and excited to be on board. So, so to date, it's been a great process, but I can see the builder could make it difficult if they wanted to. Okay, so yeah. apart from finding the right type of client, in a sense, you also need to find the right kind of builder to go with it. That's right. Who's either knowledgeable or keen to be knowledgeable, keen to help. Um, there are a couple of other questions that came through. Um, are carbon credits tax deductible? Ian? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good, the question probably already only applies to someone purchasing credits at a personal level because you know, make a, a payment to a charity it's tax deductible um a carbon credit is a mechanism it's like buying a product you know give the example if you went to the guide dogs association and you gave them a hundred dollars to buy five calendars to give you your answer for christmas that's not a tax deduction because you're buying a physical product you're passing on to them whereas if you made a donation to guide dogs a pure donation for their work that is a tax deduction at a personal level but anything you're spending as a business whether it's a charitable donation, buying electricity, by carbon credits, it's a business expense regardless. So it doesn't really matter in a sense. And I'm not an accountant, but it's, it, unless you're buying a, a, a IT equipment or a, or a car that's got a depreciator over, over a number of years, buying a carbon credit is just an expense attributable to that financial period, regardless whether it's a donation. Um, charitable donations is to be paying charities to plant trees, which aren't carbon credits. But the impact is the same on the balance sheet, I, I understand. No. But um, yeah, as a, as a consumer, if that you're a family buying the house, but could carbon credits, they obviously couldn't claim their tax, but making a donation to a charity plant trees, they could claim, but it doesn't lower their carbon footprint. But it, as a business, it doesn't matter how you spend the money, it's still a tax deduction. Okay. <laughs> it comes up quite a lot, that question. <laughs> um, uh, Paul. The um, carbon audit cost for a, a, a small office of five, for instance, or thereabouts, what, what sort of uh, costs were involved when you went through yours? And um, what would be the sort of costs involved for a, a slightly smaller office, do you think? Uh, well, I, I, was, I was just going to, and I'm hoping Ian, I think I won't um, steal Ian's thunder, but look, we... We spent about, um, uh, I think it was close to about $3,000 to get the original audit done. Um, and that was pretty much, you know, what other practices were also offering. I suppose what comes with that is the administration behind the scenes in getting the information together. Um, and that's a cost that we probably haven't put something against. Um, but in saying that, I would say there's at least, you know, full time for somebody for a week in the office to pull all that information together. Um, I think the benefit is probably now that we've done it once, we're actually now having to reassess every 12 months what we're doing. Um, so obviously we've developed some systems in place that enable us to actually um, find that information a little easier. 
Uh, and, um, uh, you know, for example, um, we have to audit all our staff about how far they've got to travel to and from work and how do they, how, what sort of transport do they use. Um, and we had, a, we had an interesting example when we did the original audit that someone put in a suburb that was about 30 or 40 k's out of Brisbane uh, mistakenly. Um, so that sort of dramatically impacted it. So you've got to also scrutinise, I suppose, the, the, the answers in some way to make sure that um, maybe people don't make those mistakes. Um, but look, you know, a lot of our people live within, you know, five, five k's of the office five to 10 Ks maximum. Um, a lot of people will use public transport. Um, and also, like I said, we've got probably about three or four people that, that ride a push bike as well. So um, that's, um, you know, that's always been a positive for us as well. I think the other interesting thing we found out, which I didn't mention was that we, we do work regionally. So we've got work in Coffs Harbour and we've got work up north, et cetera. Um, and we quickly found out that it was actually better for us to, I hate to say it, drive a car than catch a plane. Um, so, um, and that might change depending on where it is, but um, that also made us think about um, our mode of travel and how we got to and from projects as well. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And to project just on the cost too, something we recommend if a firm sort of about one to five staff, it's, it's doesn't seem justifiable to go and spend $2,000 a year plus on a footprint if your business doesn't change much year on year to, to find your footprints only 10 to 20 carbon credits. Um, so we've recommended for those businesses less than five staff, just, just measure every three years and offset based on the most recent footprint. Obviously once you get beyond five or six staff and make a judgment call, it should be measuring annually because, and also align your public statement of what you're doing as well, which is really important. Right. Okay, and um, with that, is there a, one of the questions was, uh, uh, do the certified carbon credits and accredited renewable certificates need to be renewed annually? Yeah, so you offset, uh, if, you, if your footprint was saved 70 tonnes last financial year, you buy 70 credits to offset that yeah. footprint, they get retired for that period because those emissions occurred in that period and then you measure again the next period, it might be 80 tonnes, you buy 80 credits. So it's just a, on a repeating process because okay. you're taking out the emissions that occurred in that past period. So there's another uh, another question here, and this might have to be the last one um, because I think we're going to run out of time. Paul, does your office uh, make you think now after going through the, the carbon status, do you look at uh, remote and interstate work differently or employ people living closer to the office specifically? Um, look, we don't we don't necessarily discriminate discriminate against people that um, work for our offices to where they live, um, but I suppose what we do do is we talk about um, how we can make their um, work life a little bit more flexible. So we have a number of staff members that probably live 10, 12 k's out of town, um, and we offer them the opportunity to work from home. Um, so again, that reduces their ability to have to drive into work or, or catch public transport. Um, I think the other thing too is that we've, um, if there was a, a positive side to COVID at all, um, I think it would be the fact that we've all learned how to use um, Zoom and Teams meetings as a way of communicating and um, meeting. Um, so some of our regional projects, um, we've relied a lot, a little bit more heavily on that. Um, it's become obviously forced um, on us as a result of um, what's going on. But at the same time, we've also seen some value in doing it. So um, we may continue to continue to do that um, uh, going forward. And I suppose the other thing too is, um, as you know, Andrew, we, you know, even our CASC meetings, you know, we've chosen not to meet as a group. We've chosen to meet. Um, in person, sorry, we've chosen to meet online and do it that way. And I think everyone's become better at it. Um, there's obviously still some um, issues with all those ways of communicating, but 100%, um, uh, yeah, we've, we've definitely considered other ways of um, doing work remotely um, without creating such a big footprint. Okay, all right. Well, look, I'm afraid we probably need to wrap it up there. Um, Thank you, 
uh, to the people that uh, tuned in today. And thank you to Paul, Ian and Peter. And uh, I hope it's been uh, a worthwhile webinar for, for those who joined in. So thanks for hosting, Andrew. Thank, uh, thanks so much, Andrew. Time. <laughs> Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Thank and um, we'll you. see you all later. Thanks.